Several years ago, I did a uh, integrated resource management plan for the school forest, and we wanted to improve the trail systems there, outdoor classroom sites, and things like that. And then, kind of at around the same time, the Bethel for All stuff got kicked off, and then slowly we kind of realized, oh, there's some a lot of overlap here. And um, over the years, different entities applied for different grants to do trail improvements and things like that, and we weren't successful. Well then, with a ton of help from Rebecca Stone, we were successful in getting a, a VOREC grant, which what that stands for, it's a Vermont Outdoor Recreation Economic Collaborative. So basically, linking recreation and economies of towns. And the, uh, the kind of central focus of, of this grant is sort of like the uh, emerald necklace idea of parks that you see in bigger cities, but on our small scale, it's a Bethel Green Lake. So we have all these different entities. We have the school, the Conservation Commission, um, the school forest and the athletic fields, uh, the recreation land, and a whole bunch of private landowners who uh, wanted to help and cooperate. And we have downtown Bethel, we have town forest. So we wanted to, uh, a lot of these resources, and we found more of this today when we did some roundtables this afternoon, there were a couple I didn't even know about, pieces of public land. Um, so we wanted to link these things all together and have a, an integrated uh, recreation uh, trail system that linked into downtown. This past summer with a different grant, we built a, a staircase uh, behind the brick church, which is kind of a critical link to linking the athletic fields up to the town. Um, so that's kind of the main driver uh, behind the, the Vorek grant, uh, but a critical part of that obviously is having a way for people to know where things are, how to get to things, not, not only local residents, but people passing through uh, to be able to utilize these, these um, recreational assets. So uh, a wayfinding plan, or in, in short, a signage, a, a comprehensive signage plan that includes maps is, is funded as part of the Boric grant. And um, some of the implementation of that is there is funding for some kiosks, primarily like trailhead and centrally located kiosks and, and maps. Hi, Mary, come on. Um, so, but the, the beauty of this is like, if you look around town, there's all kinds of efforts to put up signs. Some of them are legal signs you have to have. Others people have put up over the years. Some of them are no longer needed or don't even apply anymore. So you have this kind of hodgepodge. So going forward, and before we spent any of the grant money, uh, we wanted to have a professional wayfinding plan. So basically there's a, <coughs> excuse me, a template or a toolbox that can be utilized for any future funding that goes toward uh, the sign program in Bethel and, and so that it makes sense and it, it identifies and, and says Bethel. And the uh, firm of Arnett Muldrow from South Carolina uh, got the, the contract to do this. They've done this work all over the country and they'll be able to explain uh, it a lot better and um, provide some more information. And then at the end of this, if people have questions about any of the other uh, VORIC grant components, I'll be happy to answer those. So I'm Rebecca Stone, and I'm just going to add a tiny bit more to that context. I've been in Bethel for probably about 17 years now, and have been involved in the community really deeply for maybe 10 to 12, through a lot of different projects like Bethel Revitalization Initiative and Bethel University, um, Town Meeting Committee, the Bethel for All Plan, and there are a lot of themes that come out in all of these different efforts and projects that community groups are working on. But the one that I think I've heard the most consistently across all of them is that people want more information. They want to know where things are. They want to know what's here. They want to know whether they're allowed to be in spaces or what they're allowed to do in spaces. They want to know um, whether they're welcome or what they can find to do. And 
The Bethel for All plan, for those of you who don't know about it, was a comprehensive village accessibility plan that Bethel finished up last year. It really looked at a lot of different aspects, accessibility for people with disabilities, but also for everybody else who lives here. What do we need to do to make it easier to access all the wonderful assets that we have here in town? We looked at the local economy. Trip actually did a market study, an economic study for the community. We did walk audits and got out and walked on the streets to see where it feels comfortable and where it doesn't feel safe and where we have no idea where to go. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of planning sessions looking in part at parks and recreation. That was not one of the original focus areas for the plan, but it came out so strongly as a theme. We spent a lot of time at the beginning just asking people, what do you want for Bethel? What would make your life here better? What do you wish we had? And it was really striking. We got a lot of comments saying, I wish we had trails in the village. I wish we had a park in the village that I could go to. And we said, wow, we do. <laughs> Not only do we have one, so what's the issue? It's that there's no signage or information. It's not easy for people to find out what's here or how to access it. I don't think any of us on the steering committee actually knew just how many assets we had until we really started looking at maps as well. So I asked Sean to just put this up here. I know the lighting isn't great tonight, but if folks do want to dig into maps and designs, we have some copies of the plan. Uh, so as we started taking a look at Bethel, you know, one of the messages we were hearing originally is it's just a tiny little place. There's not much in the village. There's not much room to put anything in the village. And we realized, actually, all within about a 10 minute walk, there is an incredible amount of stuff already here. And it's pretty much everything you would want in a village. You've got the post office and the school and housing and library and restaurants and shops and trails and parks and a river. But that challenge is how do we connect it and make it easy to go from one to the other and make sure that people can find them. So Chris mentioned the emerald necklace idea. Does anybody know Boston's emerald necklace? Yeah, really famous park and trail system designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, one of the top landscape architects in the country. And they pitch it as Boston's backyard. Um, it's this amazing string. So pretty much anywhere you go, you can get out and get on this trail and keep walking around and discover all of these different little parks and gems. And when we looked at this map and actually started plotting out where Bethel has public land, parks, existing trail systems, it started to look an awful lot like a little bracelet. And we realized it wouldn't take much to connect those places and make it possible to go for a five mile hike around the village or to get safely between one and the other. We just need to build a few little connections and then let people know that it's here. So signage emerges one of the top recommendations in the plan to advance so many different goals. Business owners want to see more signage to get people to stop and spend time here and get out of their cars. Hundreds of people come here most weekends in fall and summer for sports games down on the fields and they go straight there. But if we had signage to help them realize it's just a five minute walk to go get a sandwich, that could boost our local economy. So many people have experienced moving into town and not knowing where things are. And it was a top accessibility recommendation too. So that's where this is coming from. Among all the different actions and projects, this one probably checks the most boxes of what people really wanted to see in the community. And we're really excited to have Arnett Muldrow. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I'm Trip Muldrow with Arnett Muldrow. Um, we are based in South Carolina. Um, our firm works with small and medium-sized communities on community revitalization projects. Uh, we've worked in over 40 states and seven countries. We're particularly proud of our work here in the state of Vermont. We've worked here for over 14 years and over 25 communities. Many of those, they run the gamut from very, very small places like Fairleigh, Vermont, and um, gosh, um, Warren and Waitsfield um, to uh, own up to Burlington and Barrie and St. Albans and Brattleboro. Um, I've had the privilege of working with Rebecca for, Rebecca occurred to me, five years now. Wow. Yes, and um, on um, a variety of projects as well. And so one of the niches that we have is not only doing market studies like we did for the Bethel for All plan, but we have Sean Turpak who is um, 
um, not only a, a brilliant uh, graphic designer, but he's become one of the um, best wayfinding planners um, in the country uh, working with us. And so um, he's going to share a little bit with you about what this plan can entail. And then we'll open it up for discussion with you all. We want to be respectful of your time uh, since you're out in the evening uh, on the eve of a, not a snowstorm potentially. Um, and, um, but um, I think it would be helpful to have him go through some of these slides um, just to show you what the plan is capable of doing. And then we can go into discussion from there. And we'll keep it fairly casual um, as far as the discussion. We may do some back and forth just to tease out some other information. We've had a series of roundtables today. So this is number four today. And then we have two additional tomorrow. We're meeting with merchants in the morning public works and VTrans officials to kind of wrap this up because as Sean will say, uh, there's a segment of this that falls into the purview of um, both VTrans guidance and Federal Highway Administration. Guidance. Saving all the fun for last. Right, right. <laughs> so um, um, we have to wrap it up. It's good what question about the round tables? What round tables were this afternoon? So we had a steering committee that um, has um, a variety of representation. We had a Recreation Roundtable, and we had a, um, a, a Community Facilities Roundtable. So um, recreation, we had the fish hatchery, we had a representat representative of um, White River, White River um, partnership. partnership, we had uh, uh, pool director, pool and director. And recreation. Chair. Right, recreation chair. And then community facilities, we had library board member, we had a school, uh, elementary school principal, um, representatives from the town itself, um, select board member, um, and representative from um, tr regional transit uh, at that meeting. And then tomorrow, you know, who knows who we'll have um, <laughs> at, at these meetings. So, but it's been a very each meeting has been very good. We've learned a lot, and we were joking with Chris. Chris said, I've even learned a few things um, on this. So um, the input's been very valuable up to this point. Uh, normally on a wayfinding plan, quite frankly, we, we, it's such a technical plan that we tend to not do a lot of uh, roundtables or public input because that's already you know been baked into the process. So we're really glad that we are doing this on, on, on this particular plan because we are learning a lot because of the nature of the work that y'all have already done. So, Sean, I hand it over to you and then we can answer any more questions and we'll move into dialogue. So I'm just going to walk through a, a quick presentation to basically talk about how we look at wayfinding, what wayfinding is to us. And this is definitely going to be more uh, vehicular oriented in this, but that's a large component of this plan and it will be the more detailed component of this plan is going to be the, the wayfinding plan that you'll see sort of at the end of this. So the why of wayfinding is to create and reinforce a sense of place. You know, we want people, whether you're residents here or whether you're visiting Bethel, to really feel like you've entered a community a sense of, and give them that sense of place and show that community pride uh, in your identity. And I liken it to putting a fresh coat of paint on your front door. You know, the, there might need to be some other places need touched up, but you know, making it, just freshening it up. And so curating the visitor experience, that's one of the things we don't have to worry about too much here because we don't have a lot of decision points. You know, we got to turn up River Street or we hit the end and we turn up Church. You know, there's not a lot, but, but that's definitely going to be something we're looking at is where the sign placement is and what that content's going to look like. Uh, but also increasing local awareness. We've had people in all of our meetings today that have learned something new about a uh, a swimming hole or a different location that they hadn't thought of or you know, hadn't heard of before. And then cleaning up sign clutter as well, looking at what's already in the built environment and ways we can either consolidate or remove outdated signs, update things. We understand that we're coming in and we may be introducing new elements to the built environment and we want to be very conscientious about that and make sure that we're trying to improve things as we go through the whole plan. And it also helps the community have that conversation internally where there's signs that are outside of our purview 
of this, but it helps kind of start that conversation about what should go and what needs to be updated and cleaned up. So what is wayfinding? Yeah, we can look at wayfinding in a pretty broad spectrum of anything that orients, uh, again, a resident or a visitor from gateway signs through the high and low speed trailblazers as you get closer into the core of your, your downtown into banners, parking, and pedestrian signs, which are also park signs. You know, we want somebody, we want breadcrumbs that lead somebody from basically the interstate to either a business or a trail. We want them to be able to navigate all the way downtown, find a place to park, get out of their car, patronize a business, walk on a trail, attend an event. Like we want them to feel confident they know where they're going and how to get there the whole uh, route. So here's just some examples of different gateway treatments, whether they're big and monumental or arches or simple pole mounted signs, you know, just creating that sense of arrival, that sense of place for the community. There's a lot of different ways that we can go about that. And with Trailblazers, we have to follow along with this wonderful uh, book. I don't know how many of you all read it over the summer, uh, but it's just a, a gripping read of eight or 900 pages, the Manual for Uniform Traffic Control Devices. It's, it's basically the DOT Bible. If you want to know what you can or can't do, you read this. And I never thought that I would read as much of a DOT manual as I have. But the Trailblazers, there's a lot of restrictions we have of where we can point people, what kind of destinations. Like we can't send them to private businesses, for profit organizations, things of that nature just aren't allowed on these signs. But we can send them to municipal facilities, we can send them to park resources, we can send them to a lot of other places. And that's part of this whole process is gathering that list of destinations ranking them to you know what can be included what their importance is to the community to the visitor and how we put those on signs and then even banners you know these are banners can be very strategic in a community so they can create a color corridor they can slow traffic where needed they can event they can promote events they can just brighten up the community there. Very cost effective investment in beautifying a community because a banner is about $50. The hardware to put it up is another $100, maybe $200. So you can do a number of these through a community really affordably. And they bring in some color. They can be informative. In Greenville, where we're at, they even use them to uh, direct people to parking destinations and, and resources so they can be very utilitarian as well. Here you see uh, in uh, West Memphis just that, that corridoring strategy. Whenever you've got a busier downtown and you've got a lot of people competing for your eyeballs, this is a nice way for the community to kind of reinforce that sense of place and that consistency through you know, what otherwise could be an attractive corridor. And then the parking, we're really good in a lot of places about telling people where they can't park, when they can't park there, but we really want to make sure we are informing people about our parking resources and how convenient they are, where they're located. And one of the fun studies I like to do is looking at a community like Monroeville, Alabama here, home of Harper Lee, that you know, we look at the downtown and we move the map over to their closest Walmart and draw an outline around that Walmart and then drop it on their downtown and tell them how walkable their community is when you have people complaining about parking when they can't park right in front of their, their store. They, they don't want to walk a block, but, but if they had to go in and get milk and socks at Walmart, they've walked the entirety of, of their downtown. I don't know why they need milk and socks, but you know, that's not my, not my problem. Mine are dry. So then we get into, you know, once we've got them to the parking resources, we transition over into um, pedestrian. For some reason, this one got cut off. But you see some pedestrian directional signage. And then in, on the right-hand side, there's cut off a pedestrian kiosk. And that's definitely going to be a large component of what we're looking at here and, and what we've been discussing internally. And we'll continue those discussions is what that system can look like for the park network. And 
We'll talk a little bit more about those details in a minute, but here's some other ideas that are included in wayfinding plans, uh, except for in Vermont, we won't talk about billboards, but park facility signs where we have, you know, the entryway and we can do iconography on these signs to let people know what amenities are in these different parks. As they drive by, they might see the name of the park, but they don't know if there's a skate park there, if it's a ball field, or you know, if it's accessible for, you know, if it's got tennis courts or pickleball or any of that. So different ways of giving people the information they need. Building signage there on the right with Indian Trail, even uh, doing you know, water towers to me. All of these signs that promote the community are different things you can use in respect to wayfinding because they create that sense of place and orient people to the destination and even trail markers there and more facility signs more for a uh, like a business park or something of that nature and then as i mentioned looking at signs that are outdated weathered battered by the the years of, of snowstorms or covered up by tree growth on the wrong side of the road or you just got 300 of them competing for your attention up there in the top right or even in the bottom right where the information's there but good luck reading it when you're in your car driving down the road it's it's very narrow it's it's out of scale so this is where good, the MUTCD really comes in handy because it does specify the best practices for sign design and then you just get to customize it with your branding and things of that nature. And so then looking at the, one of the things we've been talking about is a community we worked in called Lake Lore. And it's a beautiful mountain town with a lake that has beach access. And it's just an incredible place to go and spend an afternoon with the family. And they just love to tell you about all the things that are there and what you can't do and where you can go and what can't happen and what is going on. And it's basically like, please just stop like telling us what we can't do. And so one of the exercises that we went through working there was how do we take all of this information and distill it down into some nice, clean, simple signs that tell you what you can do. How do you do it? Like, please enjoy the views, relax, but please no alcohol or glass. The geese and ducks like fingers, so please don't feed them. Please help us keep this place beautiful and pick up litter. So, you know, it's, it's ways of telling people what they, how they should behave in your park. You know, it's, it, we all know we shouldn't go in and break bottles, climb fences, tear things down. We know we need to put those signs up in some degree for liability sakes. We have rules and regulations for skate parks and swimming pools. They're both dangerous activities. Um, you know, the city needs to protect itself in that regard. But how do we do that in creative ways that aren't just a bunch of red signs that make people feel afraid to do anything in these, uh, these places? And one of the topics has been the ball fields that they're open to the public. You can go down there, you can enjoy it, you can walk on it, you can play a pickup game when there's not another event happening, but there's also no trespassing signs. So it's like, which one? I don't know, Should I? am I allowed to be here? I see other people here, do they know the property owner? Like, we need to make sure that we're, we're signing these appropriately so people feel comfortable and confident in you know, utilizing these incredible assets we have here. So how do we go about doing this it's a, it's a punch list of sort of where we are in this process right now, is looking at the eligible destinations, we'll look at putting those all on a map, we'll identify the routes, go through the sign schedule, look at the parking resources, other uh, pedestrian signs, do the, the conceptual drawings, and then a phasing strategy. So, you know, in a community like Albemarle, North Carolina, much more dense, much more sprawling, you know, a lot more happening, but the, uh, you know, the overall concept still applies where we look at the eligible destinations, then we look at all the different traffic patterns that get people to those destinations. And you see they're ranked here where green is the primary destinations, yellow is the secondary, and then you know, some of the other ones only kind of fall into the system whenever we have space on the signs. But that starts leading into our decision points. And I don't want to scare any of you here that you're going to have 60 signs in Bethel because as I mentioned, we've only got about three or four real decision points we're going to be focused on. A um, few more than that, but you know, I, I foresee maybe a dozen signs total, and that's sort of from end to end of the community. Vehicular. 
on the vehicular signage, yes. And so then we dig deeper in and we're gonna look at parking resources. How do we get, you know, inform people of the parking assets, whether it's at the band shell, whether it's at the parking lot here by the bank. You know, we've got a number of different assets and whenever there's an event and one is full, we need people to feel comfortable that there's more parking, you know, up the street. And also, you know, what are the hours of that? Is you know, there's been talk about the lot up by Nawada having, you know, potentially being parking. You know, maybe there's other places that it's after hours parking is fine. So you know, during business hours they need it for employees or for the school or something. But after five o'clock, you know, there's ways that you can put that informational signage out there that can really help people again feel comfortable and confident that they can park there and use those. And then looking at pedestrian destinations, you know, this is where we get into being able to do more assets and more destinations because we're outside of the purview of the MUTCD. DOT is not going to come in here and yell at you for putting um, a small pocket park that doesn't have vehicular parking or putting a business directory on a map that lets people know about all the businesses that are in downtown. We have a lot more leeway whenever we get into pedestrian signs looking at the trail network. Uh, so looking at pedestrian destinations and what those signs can look like. Again, you know, the density is going to be a lot different here, but it just gets the, you know, tries to get the point across. And I was going to show one other thing. So that's basically how the system will come to, um, come to be. I don't need to know what's new there. If I can get out of there. And Sarah, I was just going to pull up the um, the Greenway. One second. So ultimately, this is a um, a plan we did in KC West Columbia in South Carolina. It's two communities that have a Greenway that run between them. And so this is sort of the, the, the vehicular wayfinding system over here on the left that shows, you know, what the design looks like in the river district and how we translated some of that shape and feel into the greenway signs. And so taking some of that inspiration from the outdoors, they had already had a, it was called the Three River um, Greenway partnership similar to the White River where it's a group that got together, a nonprofit organization, just do cleaning and maintenance. But they had a few signs out there that they had teamed up with the local Boy Scout troop to install. So they had started a bit of this language using some natural wood and so we took that and updated it with some core 10 and then just doing a simple a uh, sign typology study here. We've got some larger kiosks with the maps of the Greenway on there, showing people where they are, showing a legend of amenities, and showing some distances in time to the other destinations. Time, not, not, um, not distance, because somebody's a lot more willing to walk for three minutes than they are walk a quarter mile. And so that's one thing that we do whenever we transition into pedestrian is we want to talk about time to get there because it psychological, psych, psychology is weird. And so you can see here it's a really simple system where we've got a couple different sizes for the maps, a couple different sizes for the uh, sort of the trailhead signs and then a couple other signs for smaller directional signage, even some trail stencils for places where it's kind of in a long stretch and it's on a sidewalk, but there's driveways and there's other things. So instead of putting signs up in this neighborhood, we put stencils on the ground so that people, you know, could see that and say, okay, I'm still on the trail. I can keep, keep trucking, but it didn't add visual clutter to a, a neighborhood. And so it's a real simple system that we're going to be looking at here to where we're going to talk about monument signs for the entry to some of the, the facilities like the, the rec center or the ball fields, but also some trail markers for along the sidewalk letting people know that the stairs next to the church are part of the trail. You can walk, you know, you can take those stairs down into the rec center park. And so there's you know, just a lot of different potentials that we're going to look at, but create a system so that as this network continues to evolve and new things are happening that that Bethel will have a toolkit to go into 
and keep the system consistent, but they'll, they'll know which sign to pick out and go and put at that trail marker to let people know that that trail into the woods is safe for them and they can look at a sign and say, oh, it's, a, it's a, only a quarter mile or a five minute walk into town. Yeah, that's what we want to do is kind of connect people from you know, wherever they may be to all of the other assets in the community and let them know how close everything is, how convenient everything is, but how much there is here to do. So with that, what we'd love to do, and, and I can throw a couple things as teasers out to you, um, you know, we had some really interesting input today about, you know, some of the access to trails is through private land. So that gets into a interesting discussion on, you know, and that's a, that's a very New England thing um, and, and actually a British thing um, where in some cases we may not want to or be able to sign through private. And that may be kind of a, if you know, you know, kind of thing. We got into some fun discussion on one of the swimming holes about, you know, what defines parking and, um, you know, are we signing, are we signing to a swimming hole or are we signing to a park and once you're in the park, you figure out you can swim. It just gets into these fascinating discussions. We even had a, you know, we went on a tangent a little bit with the fish hatchery, which is, you know, a little bit further out and the old CCC camp is adjacent to it where those trails are a bit overgrown at this point and there's some state land near there as well and all of this becomes this fascinating piece of the discussion so what we'd love to do is open it up to you because we're at the beginning of the process on things that you think we should be paying attention to things that you know um, that you'd love to see kind of um, addressed in this plan because we have a lot of um, breadth and what we can address in this, um, I mean, we heard loud and clear, you know, we want to make sure we're saying where people can park and what those rules of engagement are. And uh, we also learned some of the things that are in progress, like the sign that you see out front here that, that was hit and is propped up right now is currently being redesigned. And so, you know, just because we're here doing the plan doesn't mean time stops in Bethel. Um, and so we have to make sure that we're accommodating things that are already progress. So I'll throw that on the table. We are here to have a dialogue with you. We've had a fantastic discussions today. We have the screen open. If you want to go back to something or even if you want to navigate to something to look at, we can uh, do that as well. So we just want to open it up to you for discussion. We've had a lively discussion today. So, so where's the swimming <laughs> Great question. So we learned of three today. Um, the, the, the swimming hole is at, um, thank you. I believe uh, it's. Peavine Boulevard. It's before the bridge, yes. Um, and there's a little pull off there. And there's a sandy beach there. Now, on past, we've heard this too, now we don't know, we did not get full directions, so people are withholding information, mm -hmm. and that's okay. Um, but past the CCC, old CCC camp, past the fish hatchery, are some roads that lead to some additional swimming holes uh, further downstream, uh, the White River. But this one apparently is a good one because it's a, a low beachy entrance, mm -hmm. so it's good for, um, for the younger ones, because it's not. I mean, there's more, we've discussed this in previous meetings, but there's much more potential over there to actually build some kind of a path that leads to a place where you can actually view the village from down below and see the falls and so mm -hmm. So that's, that's all in keeping with where that, where that beach is. And nice. I think you're making a really good point, something we've heard through the day, too, is that this system needs to accommodate future things that aren't here yet that may be here later. The last thing we want to do is design a system that if something new is added, you have to take the whole panelized system down and reinstall signs. So there are a lot of different ways to take care of that, whether it's allowing some real estate on an existing panel or having a, a multi-panel system where you can add new destinations. And, hey, and while I was talking about I just have because I came here all fired up for a specific project that I just wanted to you know, get out there that 
we've talked about in the Conservation Commission. But there's a, there's a feature called Flagpole Hill that's behind the town. Maybe that came up before. Yeah, it has. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, yeah. I, I mean, I did a hike to Flagpole Hill from Sanders Road, but then I went back. I was so fired up about it. I went back to Brandlier Forest and hiked up to Flagpole Hill from that. And, Ooh, and you didn't get and, lost? No, because I, <laughs> I had my events. It took me a year to, to, to get there from North Main Street. Yeah. Yeah, I went with you. Yeah, you went with me. So I did, so I did and I, I discovered that very little work would be needed to to hook the two up. Hardly any. Well, that's what I found it was just that we, we heard today that from behind here to get there, we do have to cross private property. Yeah. Yes. And so that gets to, you know, a fascinating discussion on we can absolutely sign through that with the property owner's permission, you know, and there might be an opportunity to say, to say you are entering private property through the generous, you know, please take care of people, you know, whatever you want to say to kind of, you know, let people know that there's someone very nice letting you do this. Um, and then and then once you get into the, the town forest, you you know, it, it connects together or something. Like that. Yeah, you're right. There's two or just <coughs> two or three of all years that we need three, I think it's three of them do the whole thing. And I have Mary to thank for Nancy, getting, yeah. Oh, sorry, Nancy, yeah. for the, uh, the hike during Beth mm -hmm. University. But so, yeah, Mr. Ge Geico, who owns yeah, the, yeah. The, where the flagpole is, but there's is also, very accommodating. But we heard he's very kind and, and yeah. probably he, would he be one of the He loves to have people come, come up there. And also noble, because there's a beautiful path that takes you down almost to North Falcon Drive. It's, it's perfect. You just have to drive the last bit down. Anyway, I didn't do that part, but it seemed that very doable. That trail's pretty bad. Though. What's that? That trail there is pretty bad. It's in kind of bad shape now. Some of it is, and some of it isn't. Some of it is in really good shape. Did you get right? no, from the top. Right, right, no. From the top. You guys don't need to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, want to, <laughs> I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but I just want to make sure because that is like, wow. I mean, what a resource that whole yeah. place is up on that ridge, and um, it wouldn't take a whole lot. It's all, you know. There's logging roads up there. There's yeah. perfect paths. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and you're hitting on another thing that came up in one of our discussions, and we are, if, if you did participate in the Bethel for All, uh, Stephen, who worked on the accessibility piece of that, will be working with us on this mm -hmm. as well. So we got into an interesting discussion on, you know, how do we accommodate um, ability and technical ability and also accessibility for people who, you know, may not, you know, may be differently abled, so to speak, so that so that we're not sending someone down a trip that's beyond their technical capability. Mm -hmm. Or, and here's the other thing I get excited about, is once the, the culture continues to develop, and we've seen this in other communities, that people become very proactive about, okay, well, we don't have a trail yet that's fully wheelchair accessible, maybe that's something we need to contemplate later on as we continue. And the good thing about all of the work that has been done here as well as you all have Andrew Plotsky, is the last name? Yeah. that has done a lot of the design work for the, uh, the, Bethel, or the Bethel for All, and the Bethel Strong, the library, and he is on the steering committee and he's also willing and able to help implement and like flesh out the full system so that if, if there's icons that we haven't thought of in this initial phase as we're putting this plan together, like the um, the falls overlook or the uplook. I don't know what you call that when you look up at a fall. Um, but you know, if, if that trail through Peavine leads under the dam where you can kind of see the village, you can see that, then that's an icon that he can add to the system later or something else like that comes up. We're hoping to have a really expandable system of icons and sign types so that we can kind of combine those and put all that information in, in one one location for, for all the different site types of signs that might come up. And we see this both as a, you know, thing like the kiosks, there's funding for those to go to be installed. There's funding for some uh, web and, and digital and print, you know, communication. Mm -hmm. So we see this project actually having two sets of deliverables, a set that can kind of be used and implemented right away, and then a set that I kind of call the, the kitchen cupboard set, you know, where we're keeping it in the cupboard 
and when it's time to use it, the toolbox, you know, we can open it up and pull the, that down and make the next ingredients because you're not having to reinvent the wheel because the tool, toolbox has it all in it. The gun has it. Chip, it may be worth saying too, for those of you who don't know much about that VORAC grant, there are a lot of other pieces that you didn't hear about, including new trail buildings. So there will be, hopefully, a <laughs> wheelchair accessible loop or path down on the athletic fields. There are already new paved pathways at the recreation center leading to the skate park and the play structures so that people in a wheelchair can get to those. Um, a number of other improvements. There'll be big trail development or expansion behind the recreation center in the school that's a little harder levels. So a lot of things coming in to meet some of those other accessibility needs and recreation needs that people have been asking for. I wanted to ask you about visual identity, which has come up a little bit. Um, I know through the Beth for All plan, and I was also on that steering committee, it came up a lot that we don't have a town logo or town colors or anything of the like. There's a town seal that I don't think we have a good resolution file of we don't. in existence. <laughs> um, and just how you were thinking about that through this process. Well, what a great, insightful um, <laughs> slider. <laughs> no. um, so it's a brilliant question. We. Um, I didn't hear the question. Sorry. So the question uh, pertained to in the Bethel for All plan, there was a lot of uh, discussion and input on the lack of a consistent identity for Bethel as far as typeface colors. Um, you know, so I'll just use an example. If you logo, if you go to the state of Vermont, there's a whole set of guidelines that gives you the like the official green. That's the green that's used by all state agencies. You know the moon and the mountains. You know. There's a, or the sun and the mountain, you know, they call it the moon and the mountain. Um, you know, all that is part of a style guide. Um, this uh, sign plan will be incorporating that into it as far as consistent colors and typeface recommendations. We are using the massive survey work that was done during the Bethel for All to be able to help inform that. So there's a whole set of survey work that was done on the brand identity of Bethel that um, we felt like we can leverage along with Andrew's help and our steering committee's help to create some consistency data. And we're sliding it in because, into the wayfinding and the sign system because we have to, I say we have to, in many cases there's places on the signs for that identity to go where that's consistent. We are walking a, I won't say a fine line, we're walking an interesting line in that we're fully aware that the official town seal and town logo are, like they're lacking vector art, they're lacking that kind of stuff. And so we're kind of leaving the door open to fill that in with with all due care, if that makes sense. So I'll use a, a practical example. But updates to that isn't part of the system? It's not necessarily, but we have the capability of doing it. And so, and that's why I was leading to that. And I had to verify before I went to this meeting. So when we worked for the Berry Partnership on their new branding back post Irene, we knew the city of Berry. it's a city, I think, um, it's not a town, it's a city. It's both. It's both. There's Barry there's Town city. and there's We were working for Barry City. Um, sorry. We are working for Barry City. That They had the same issue. And so what we did is our task wasn't to do a new city seal or a new city logo, but we actually vector art. We did vector art for their seal and we did the city. And they're still using that along with the Barry Partnership and those two identities talk to one another. And much the same way when we worked in Montpelier, we were working for the downtown group, but we ended up doing all of Montpelier's departmental identities as a result. This scope allows us, we don't have as big of many departments here and all that, <laughs> the scope allows us to go down that path. The care I want to take with that is our budget's fairly limited, so we will probably do like what we did in Barry and give it and if folks want it, 
they can have it. If they don't, you've got Andrew and other local talent that can maybe take it through to that next level. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. So, uh, and that's why we're glad that he's willing to serve on our steering committee too, because um, we've been really fortunate in our work in Vermont to have local talent that can pick up where we leave off. Um, so we want to look at it, but I'm, I'm holding the throttle on it to say, first and foremost, we need to get the system down, we, and we do need to get some color consistency down, and we do, we, we do need to land on a typeface. Um, I don't know if we really need to get into things like taglines and, you know, that kind of identity. Um, you know, that's, that's a whole other level um, to kind of get into. But, I mean, this one's really itchy to get to the <laughs> official, you know, iconography at, at the town level. And I'm saying, don't promise yet, Sean. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm staying very quiet. Right. I'm staying very, I said, don't promise yet, but I, we know we have an issue that we need to, to cope with. Our hope is that through this, we can find an agreement. And what I will say, what we're finding too, is a lot of, um, I'd love to hear your feedback. We're, we're hearing a lot of positivity toward the Bethel for All color system and type face because that process went for several years. The web page is up and running. And it's like, why would we start over again if we've got something really strong? And it does match very well the sentiment chart that was done through the survey where folks don't want things to be too formal. They don't want it to be too old timey. You know, they want it to be casual. It's kind of cool how that notches in, but we're still kind of yeah. we're gonna we're gonna work through that to see what nuances come out of it. And Andrew has provided a lot of the artwork he has done for uh, the Bethel Strong, the Bethel for All, the even the library designs that he's worked on. The um, the festival, the Forward Fest, you know, a lot of those. So I've already sort of deconstructed a lot of that into the typefaces and the color palettes that have been used and have built that equity. Um, but you know, earlier in one of our conversations, we had the lady from the Historic Society and she's asking about building markers, you know, and being able to put historic plaques on buildings, letting, that, letting people know that this, either this location or this building is a historic component of our community and we wanna tell people that story. So we're really trying to figure out how best to create a broad enough color palette that we can include things like the vibrant forward fest but also historic building markers and so we want that flexibility in the system but not having 20 colors in the palette as well and so then looking at the typeface and what he's chosen works really well for certain applications but how do we add another tool that plays off of that and works well with it but gives a slightly different characteristic to the message so that's all things that we're going to be digging into creatively to look at what how we can build off of the equity that's already been built into all of the planning and all of the input that the community has already been involved in without asking you those same questions again to get those same answers uh, you know that a lot of that work has been done already it's just going to be a matter of us digging deeper into all those materials and and kind of sussing out where we, you know, where we can go with it and um, without reinventing the wheel. But this is a great opportunity to say, please think about this or, you know, have you looked at this or, mm -hmm. or, and we've heard it already today, we do not want to look like Woodstock, you know, that, <laughs> that, that are, that, that, and not look like, we're not talking about the physical environment, we don't want our brand or identity to have that level of formality and, well, I won't say anything else. Right, have that like, right yeah. yeah. I think we, physical environment too. <laughs> right, well, and, I mean, yeah. look, I've worked in Vermont long enough to know that Stowe and Woodstock alternate back and forth between snootiest towns in Vermont every other year. So. I lived in Woodstock for 40 years, true confession, and, and the common phrase there in Woodstock is, 
We love living in Woodstock because it's so close to Vermont. <laughs> oh, <wow>. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they see that that joke is in Burlington too. So oh, yeah. 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 So that was a joke um, <coughs> ten years ago. What's so good about um, um, Burlington? It's so close to Vermont. <laughs> I was in for Jim's last week, and that joke was alive and well. <laughs> but, but I mean, welcoming any feedback or thoughts on that. Is there any discussion about having signage on Peavine? Like a lot of people like, walk along Peavine, even though there's no the boulevard. The road? <laughs> yeah, the road itself. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, a, that's definitely something to look into as we consider what types of signs that we're going to be including in the overall system. Whenever you have, whenever I showed you that Greenway system, that was a really easy system for us to figure out where the signs went, for the most part. There's still you know, a lot of puzzles to figure out, but it's very linear. So it's easy to put a sign here, and you're either going that way or that way, and this is the distance to your next stop or the one after that. Um, and so looking at trail markers for things like roadside pathways or those connective trails is definitely gonna be something we're gonna have to look at and how we tackle in the system because it's not like we can say, you know, you're at the half mile mark because if there's different loops going different directions, that isn't gonna make sense to anybody but reassuring signs of saying, hey, you're on the Peavine Trail, every quarter mile or every, you know, around every turn or whatever that might be, might not be a bad idea to include so that you know, even though you're on this dirt path, you're technically on one of our greenways. It's just, you know, it, it's not a paved sidewalk, basically. But yeah. thinking about Peavine Boulevard itself, oh, maybe yeah, an opportunity it's, it's, to, one thing, again, that was snowing really heavily on it, but it's relatively flat, you know, by comparison. So that might be a really cool opportunity for a, like a shared cycle route where maybe there's additional signs that kind of reinforce a shared road ethic or something well, like that. That's what I've seen about the car, cars going <clears throat> too fast. Too fast, mm -hmm. you know, they're mm -hmm. out of town and they don't know that it's, you know. The character of the road, yeah. yes. and. I think you're hitting the nail on the head on, to me, that's a great link opportunity that's not just a vehicular one. Yeah, because so. yeah, people walk, they walk their dogs, they walk themselves. Um, and I was on a road recently in a community that, road, street, picket, you know, but there were signage all along, it's like, this is a shared street. And it was kind of this constant reminder that you are sharing the street, both for the walker, you know, too, to be aware of the vehicle, but for the vehicle to be aware of the walker and the cyclist, that this, this, this is shared. And, and, so. and we use it for a 5K oh. um, run and during the Florida Festival. Nice. And one of the things that we've seen with systems that whenever you in, uh, integrate a consistent design into the built environment that it really helps people slow down and pay more attention because whenever they're used to seeing these signs they, they sort of digest the fact of like people other people are using these signs and those are pedestrian scale signs and if there's pedestrian scale signs there's probably pedestrians and so it's you know it's, it can slow down traffic it can make people more aware because they see that consistency and so that can a great help. example of that, I was on Nuns Island in Montreal this weekend, and I, I was going into a park, and there was a cul-de-sac, and there was a road off of that, and it had the sharrows, the bike sharrows in it. And the sharrows were so big, <laughs> and there were no other cars going down that road that I was like, there's no sign that says I'm not supposed to bring the car here, but there's definitely a strong indication that the bike takes priority here. And I'm not in my home country, and I don't want to have an argument with someone, so I'm just going to turn around and park over here, you know? And, and so it was kind of a, you know, the road itself kind of just said everything it needed to say. At the end of the day, it turns out there was parking there, but that was overflow parking, so they did exactly 
it, it served as exact purpose of kind of discouraging me from going further, but knowing that if they needed it, that was one that they could do over from parking too. Mm -hmm. so. I think, see, that route did definitely get attention in the Bethel for All plan. It was one of the routes that had a walk on it, so if you're really walking the whole route to see where it feels unsafe, where people are confused, things like that. Um, and it's a big priority. It's not one of the top recommendations in the plan, but had several clear recommendations to really integrate signage as we're talking along the whole loop along with certain changes to the roads to make it safer. So some of them are really small, actually. Removing the center line will help slow down cars and make that a safer space and putting fog lines along the outside. So that was one of the top recommendations that probably just needs to wait until it gets paved again or the next time the town is doing that. Um, Shara's were one that would be easy to do. I mean, really, the town could do that at any point <laughs> and go out and put those on, or a volunteer group could go and do that. I actually have a giant eight foot stencil in my basement. <laughs> um, we talked about you know putting benches in a couple of strategic places so that people could rest. So a lot of those are really doable things. They weren't fundable by VoRec, which is really focusing more on natural spaces, but there are plenty of grants. It's mostly about a group coming together and saying, yeah, we want to do this. I'm running out of places to put benches with that I'm getting with the plastic, so yeah. we're going to put one off the trail over by uh, behind the school mm -hmm. uh, as soon as we're sure that snow is gone. We've, I've got one sitting on my back porch right now, ready to go. And uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I literally am finding it harder to find places, so keep that in mind. That is every thousand pounds of plastic I get, and we should coordinate on that too, because benches are another part of the grant. Thinking about, you know, what should they look like? Should there be consistent look and feel, and where should they go? The and I yeah. think you're hitting on another thing that we want to explore is we're always we always try to be very cognizant of the history of the community. So, you know, what opportunities do we have to use Bethel White marble where appropriate? What opportunities do we have to maybe right. use? Uh, hewn, what's that? Granite. Granite, Granite sorry. <laughs> and, um, that's going to hurt for a long time. And, um, and then, um, that is going to hurt for a long time. And um, where can we use like hewn wood or saw wood because of, you know, the, the history of, of that here as well. So, so how do we make sure that we're you know, of course, I love the idea of the recycle. You know, if there's a story behind it that's a legitimate story, how can we integrate that in? Yeah. Yeah. With the pedestrian signs, has there been some discussion about um, <coughs> you know, getting QR codes in there that, so you can limit how much information you have to include on the sign you get, for additional information? Use the well, and the good thing about a QR code is as long as you keep that QR code live and active, you know, wherever that landing page is, that information is a lot easier to update than a printed yes. panel or something yeah. that's, a, yeah. you know, mounted to that kiosk. So absolutely, QR codes are part of the discussion. We've, we've joked about how many times QR codes have died, um, but they keep crawling back and the pandemic with menus and, 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 yeah, and, and, and every phone manufacturer putting them right into the camera. So. I will caution, like anything in life apparently, they can be co-opted. So there is, I, I do still, um, I'm, cautious, I'm not really cautious about when I use it, but I am thoughtful about when I use it because what's happened in other places is certain, some people will go and they'll print out a QR code that's the same size as the one that's on the oh. sign and they'll go and stick it over that. Wow. And it can send either to somewhere stupid or somewhere malicious. And so, you know, if, whenever we get used to just pulling point, point our phone and clicking on the link, yeah. um, there's always ways somebody's gonna find to scam you. And so it is an unfortunate reality. Um, it's, a, it's pretty uncommon. Um, but it is one thing that whenever I do, I have put them on signs and you know, I tell people if you're out maintaining them and you're looking at them, just go up and make sure it's still yours. You know, just kind of do a little audit occasionally, go through, just pull out your phone, you know, yeah. you know, check, make so sure you it's want to do it sparingly. Yeah. Um, but they, I mean, yeah. you know, and it could be, and we always grapple with this internally, 
or with our communities on, you know, like a vehicular wayfinding sign, we want that thing to be there. We want it to have a 25, 30 more year lifespan. There are other signs that, you know, realistically, we're looking at probably a, a 20, 25 year lifespan or less, or a kiosk where the kiosk might have a 30 year lifespan or a 25 year lifespan, but the information within it can be changed every three months or every four months. So um, that that's another way to kind of treat all this too, is what the permanence with which you do it. And then, you know, we know too that like on a vehicular wayfinding side, the pole, the poles and their, you know, the footers, the footers thank you. Um, Look, I'm still torn by calling it marble. <laughs> um, the footers um, are the more expensive part. The panels are re re relatively cheap. So, what we want to make sure we're doing is, is you know, is if a panel gets damaged, then that that's not too terrible an expense to repair or replace. Are you planning signage for the kiosks that exist that are empty and have been since they went up at Irene? <laughs> There's one down at Marsh Meadow. There are a couple of others. Yeah, I think three or four. Right. What'd you say? The Gilead and Bridger were 12. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Panels for those are funded by Volrock. Not permanent, but I think we wrote into their um, basically core class signs, like the political yard signs, which that's pretty long, mm -hmm. <laughs> but doing a design of those and getting them up so that at least we can try out mm -hmm. some content there and see what it feels like. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, what, have, what about where two entities meet, like with the White River Partnership and Access? So which, You've really which been, designs do you use? Really right. good question. And that is something that came up. We had a representative from that partnership here earlier, and they... Yeah. They um, they even like offered up paying for the signs if the, some of their information was included, and it brings up a really valid point because they've got locations north and south of here yeah. along the the waterway that are using the same signs. And as I've mentioned through all of this, consistency is very important. So that's something else. Much like all of Andrew's work, I want to look at what they're doing and see if there's something and some way that we can incorporate what they're doing to inform the designs that we're doing they're perfectly, so that there's they consistent. They are perfectly willing, and when I saw their sign mm -hmm. concepts, mm -hmm. they're perfectly willing to take, how put this right, take second position, if that makes sense, so that your identity can take position one. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that sounds weird, but I mean, you know, if there's a color scheme or whatever, theirs is a, Theirs is an insert within, but it doesn't fill the whole board. So, um, and, and we often, and there are a lot of different ways we can treat that, that hierarchy, you know. Um, and we deal with this with a lot of parks where, you know, there's funding that comes from, you know, grants where you need to have that on the side or whatever, and that's perfectly fine. But this goes back to one of your earlier questions about the flag. And whenever we're looking at this, we're, we've already talked to a representative from the school, from the White River partnership, and looking at the potential of private property owners of allowing people egress through their property to get to different destinations. How do we incorporate all of those identities onto the relevant sign so that if somebody's coming up, they see the trail, but they see the school, and they're like, are we allowed on this trail? Well, the sign should be able to convey very easily that you are on the trail network, this is school property, but please you know, respect the property and you're more than welcome to utilize this trail. Same goes for a private property owner. If they are willing to allow people to pass through their property, then you know, let us put up a sign telling people what the, you know, they're on private property, Please be yeah, respectful. I can see stay on the trail. At the entrance to the private property, you have 
assigned them, tells you specifically that, and then you just have a logo for a blaze. Correct. Exactly. That's correct. And the same goes for the, the White River partnership. You know, you are on your, you know, you're in Bethel, but you're on the White River. Because if you're part of a bigger network, you, it's almost like having the imprimatur of that network. So, you know, we do a lot of work in communities along the Appalachian Trail where, you know, I mean, you'll see the AT logo within the community because they know the power of the brand of the AT. And so you definitely want to acknowledge your regional alliances when you're connecting to a regional network. That's a really awesome opportunity. Because so, uh, uh, the East Coast Greenway is another great example. I mean, the East Coast Greenway is completely segmented from Florida all the way up through Maine, but it's, you know, w when you're on a piece of it, there's a, you, you, you can recognize that icon right away, and you know, oh gosh, I'm, I'm actually on something that maybe my grandchild will be able to see completion, you know. Those regional trails were another thing that I remember surprising a group when we actually looked at what comes here. A lot of people have never heard of the White River Water Trail or know that it's a thing. There's the Northern Tier Cycle Route, which is a cycling route that goes all the way across the country. It comes right through downtown Bethel. Which is phenomenal. The fast trails connect really Even close to you. Uh, what's even as a newcomer to the town, you don't know those things are there. <laughs> but even long-term people don't know these yeah, things are here, that they connect. And well, the people using those trails don't know what's in town to come right. and use. And, yeah. and this also is a great way for long-time residents and to remember, too, the things that we kind of forget about. You know, like, like you know, when my kids were young, I loved to go into that swimming hole in the summer. and. By golly, I'm going to get my friends together and we're going to go down there this weekend. You know, I mean, or the grand, I'm going to take the grandkids, you know, that kind of thing. We see that as the, one of the neatest side effects of this is people often think of this as visitor centric when in fact it's the local community that kind of revels in it uh, more than anybody. So, and we can have opportunities in the system to talk about what's next. So, you know, if you reach the end of something, you know, stay tuned. Or, um, I, I remember, you know, it's funny, because I didn't work on this project with Sean, he was talking about the multi along the river. I remember riding that and getting to the end and to a fence line. And basically there was a sign there, it's like, you know, next phase, it'll be another five, seven miles this direction. And, and that's been completed. Other thoughts for us? I really like what Andrew did. Mm -hmm. All of his work is great. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, these are great colors and fonts and but it's, it's clean. Like it's clean. Mm -hmm. It's easy to understand. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it is familiar already, even though it's kind of his colors. <laughs> The green matches really closely to the school district's green, which we learned today is UVM's green. Uh -huh. um, exactly. We don't know that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I hear that, I'm always very skeptical because the state greens, there's two shades of the state greens. And then I don't know if UVM's green is anywhere close to the state green. But uh, this will probably cost me some sleep tonight. <laughs> verifying all Your this. Yeah. <laughs> we, were, we were working together oh, yeah. in Maryland, and we, we we were working together in Maryland, and we learned that the University of Maryland's yellow or gold on there that has the flag right. is totally different than the gold for the flag itself. Like oh. they're totally different colors, mm. and we don't know why. That decision was made, but we were doing a system where we had to pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you get into this weird stuff, and then and then we're moving away. You're moving away from, from Pantone. We've moved away from Pantone because yeah. Pantone 
because of what they've done. Well, yeah, they're requiring licensing and a subscription, and we don't know how that affects end users and clients. So we just can't, get in good conscience, use Pantone to tell people what color. We still build it in RGB, CMYK, and hexadecimal, whether you're doing web or print, and basically tell anybody, if, if you're working with a print vendor that requires a Pantone, they should be able to recommend a close enough match and give you a proof of you know that that color and you can verify it so pantone it's called pantone matching system and it is a company that for decades i've been a graphic designer for 30 years it's like um, kleenex um, yeah, it is. of color yeah 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 so like the kleenex of tissues that's what pantone is to color mm -hmm. they, they're the branded they're the ones that come out every year with the color, color of the year. year. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and so they've been, like anybody that's been a graphic designer has used Adobe, used any of the software. Pantone's always been in the software. You pick a color, you can use it, and then they're like, hey, we're not making enough money, so we're gonna start charging people subscriptions, and that it's just kind of messed up. A good conscious do that, because so many of our clients are small, Small, either nonprofits or small towns, and we just can't handcuff them to another entity that's going to charge them okay. over and over. Again. Appreciate that you're proactively thinking about. It. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we're proactively again thinking too about you know uh, color contrast, color blindness, you know mm -hmm. some of those other things that accessibility <laughs> issues that need to be factored in as well. This is super. These are great questions. They're super, like. Um, Detail oriented. Detail oriented. I'll say nerdy, <laughs> but we're nerds. Like we're, yes. we're totally into. You know, I was meeting with Laura Perrette this morning, who was the brand steward for Waterbury, and she was joking around about how people were getting the script wrong, and she would go up to them and say, "You do realize that if you go here on the website, you can pull down the exact typeface mm -hmm. and get it right." You know, and so at the end of the day, there will be a toolbox available. Here to be able to pull the colors right. As I showed that report up there that had just, I just showed the um, the signs in there, but in there it will have all the typefaces specified, all the color builds specified, um, even scale of vehicular signs, pedestrian signs, they'll have all the typology there. We'll probably have scale of those signs as well. Design files so we can recreate things? Or is that Everything will be vector. Yeah. Yeah, we do not, the only thing we retain ownership of is the right to use it for our own promotion. So we, so that's- So we all implement, we can go tell the story, but we yeah. do not retain ownership. Yeah, you're not gonna have to come back and pay us to use the files, no. Yeah, we encountered that early in our history where graphic designers were, they were providing the concept and they were charging again to actually get to the files. Yeah. Like, we can royalty just, fees. We can, we can That's why I have a job now is because they wanted, you know, designers to on staff to do it for the community. So the community paid basically you pay once and and we're out of your hair. We turn over everything. We're and never, again, we're never fully out of your hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's why we love people like Andrew is because we want to come in with a fresh perspective. We want we you know do this all over the country so that we've seen things that work other places. We've seen things that don't work. So we get to come in and bring that expertise. But we want to turn the tools over to you all so that you can work with your local either whether it's a designer, whether it's a your mill that's going to make you know, the posts, whether it's, you know, whoever it is, you might have a sign company or a t-shirt printer or somebody else locally. We want to encourage those relationships so that it kind of grows and everybody gets invested in the whole process and it just makes it a much better product at the end of the day. Awesome. We've kept you over an hour. I just wanted to make one comment and maybe a question to a couple of people here. So last year somebody brought up the idea of signs on buildings and I remember with the accessibility on it that was done by Direct Access, who's continuing to work, some of their recommendations actually really surprised me. I was expecting they would be very focused on access for people with disabilities, but a lot of them really focused on creating a welcoming experience and 
you know, historic signs, photographs, stories about the downtown were one of their key mm. recommendations. So it would be great to have something I, along actually, those lines included. That was one of the um, more fascinating things that came out of our roundtables today was having the historical society um, representative mention the notion of some of the places that are no longer standing, yeah. that were old schools or um, and I'm like, gosh, you know, and this is where the QR codes could come in handy right. too, where yeah. we're actually working on a project with Rosenwald schools in South Carolina um, and their African-American schools that were built during the Jim Crow era. And we're losing the alumni because, mm -hmm. you know, many of those schools closed mm -hmm. with uh, desegregation. And so the, uh, we're capturing their stories. And so at the sites, there are going to be QR codes where you can either hear or watch the alumni tell the story. Wow, and, wow. and that's super powerful because once these, um, these senior citizens leave us, you know, this is a, and it's a missing chapter in, in, um, in America's civil rights history is we talk a lot about slavery and post-slavery and civil rights for the Jim Crow era. There's a whole section. It's just there's not a lot about what happened during that time, mm -hmm. and meeting these alumni is just like you're hearing the stories. And it is you know you have to like shivers are going down my spine just thinking about some of the people I've met. You know, and it's like we can't lose these stories because if we lose them, we're going to lose a huge part of American history. Mm -hmm. So that's great. My practical question is to Danny and Mary and Chris especially. It made me wonder if you're all thinking on the Conservation Commission about interpretive signage, um, I feel like I've heard that idea tossed around before, and I don't know if it's directly from you or other people, but if it is, would that follow the same format, or do you have thoughts in mind already? Mm -hmm. Talk about it generally, but even in more detail, just we have conservation land that nobody knows it's there. Some right on main road sometimes, so you know, a sign identifying like you see in other towns, this is Carver's Meadow Conservation Area, or right. um, Quimby Town Forest, or, or even what's on Route 12, but by right. uh, Gilead. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. that's right. Even that. <clears throat> right. But also, especially the photographs, I, I keep coming back and I keep picturing photographs of the mill, you know, mm -hmm. just, just right downtown, a little pocket park, right across from here, just to get people to the railing and look at the water. And, you know, be able to see some photos and QR code maybe for additional history. Or There's a fascinating or, history. To yeah, extent. even a world oh, history. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, we have world history. Oh, my God. And that right. is town land. Yeah, I, I know. It's not right it business, so yeah. it's possible. Yeah. And I love the idea, too, you know, where, you know, if you really want to encourage people to kind of stay or spend time or, or you know, where you're getting a piece of the story, and then you know in another piece you're going to get another piece of the story. So that could be really cool. Um, and then you can get different perspectives. Uh, or if you don't have time, that kind of leads you back to a master page where you can... I'm notorious. I will go to a place, I will see a few things, and then I will spend the next week obsessing, you know, and read backwards. I'm, I do it in reverse, you know. I go for the experience, and then I go like, well, why did this happen? And, how did this happen and why did this happen? So the next time I come back, I know more about it. I shouldn't do it that way, I know, but that's how I have to do it. So. How, do, how do you avoid things getting too complicated? Because I was just thinking in terms of, um, I mean, I heard a couple things tonight I didn't even know about. I didn't know about this bike trail going northern tier, whatever. It is. I didn't know about that. But uh, you got so many trails, so many pedestrian trails, um, so many human powered trails. Mm -hmm. Uh, multi-use, some are just walking, some are, you know, biking, some, you know, and you got the canoe route, you got the bike route through here, you've got um, Ridgeland Outdoor Collective has trails that are near here, you know, it's just, and maybe it's too much information, so how do you manage to layer that in or make it available to people without it being overwhelming? That's a a brilliant question that we're going to work on answering. <laughs> so, and, I mean, it's a nice problem to have. It is. It, it, problem is, have. it really and, is. And the, and the nice part about it for us is that when we get, we're so limited in what we can tell people in a vehicle. 
and then you really want to let to meet people where they are if that makes sense so there's no point in downtown Bethel to get into all the technical aspects of the entire trail system but for a trail enthusiast once they get there you know that might be where you open the door for exploring more so that you're kind of putting the information out at the level where people want to consume it when they want to consume it. Yeah, it's sort of like, what do, you, what do you want to do while you're here? Mm -hmm. And I look at it in the terms of like granularity. Like the closer you get to a destination, the more granular the information becomes. And so, you know, from the interstate, we say Bethel. Once you start getting into Bethel, we say downtown or the park. Once you get to the park, we're going to say, you know, we're going to park, you get park, and then we're going to say, are you here for the pool, swimming pool, skate park. skate park, or the trail? You get on the trail, what do you need to know on the trail? It's left or right, you know? So it's like we get more granular, and the information, that's going to be one of the challenges of, like, looking at the monumental gateway sign as you come into the rec park. You know, what information do we have to have on there that you can reasonably read either driving by at a reasonable speed or pulling in as far as park park name park hours um, amenities are we going to put icons on there for all the different amenities that each park has on their sign and then some emergency contact information you know like who are the partners in this park you know if we're putting a sign out on the river are we going to have the uh, white river uh, partnership on there you know so that's all of that information is really part of the puzzle that we're going to have to put together and answer that very question because what we're not doing is the complete system where we are going in and specifying okay this sign needs to go right here and it needs to say this and then once they get past this and they get onto the trail this sign is going to say that what we're going to be doing is saying all right your gateway signs for your parks are either going to be the large one here with this information or they're going to be a smaller one depending on your physical environment or your budget you know what size goes there then once you get in what is the next sign what does that kiosk look like once you park your car and get out because we want that kiosk to be more universal you can see that kiosk at the ball fields or you can see it at the rec park or you can see it maybe in, even in one of the park parks downtown people are you know walking between shops and they see a trail network kiosk say oh we can we can walk all over the place after we have a sandwich or a cup of coffee and so we're going to be defining the sign types and so that it's still going to be a bit of now chunks of it mm -hmm. but not the we'll go from the biggest level we'll kind of fill it out to templates where it's going to be we'll give enough to kind of show how to do it and then as things flesh out those templates can be replicated and then there's, so there may be occasion where the report will be the guideline, but you're looking at this going, um, this is a weird location, what are we going to do? And you're going to have to modify what the, one of those signs might be. So a great example, when we showed you that Lake Lure um, thing, and I was just curious before this meeting, because I, I mean, I knew that they had redone stuff, but I didn't know what the sign actually looked like in the end. And so, lo and behold, someone had Instagrammed the actual sign because they ended up putting more rules on it, but they were all humorous. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, but they were able to do that because that was the main entry into the park. And so that one sign eliminated something like 25 signs. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and then at the end of the day, it became kind of a, a fun thing because once you zoom in and start reading it there's like a there's a little i don't know like a turn of phrase or a you know not a joke per se but a turn of phrase or an interesting thing pun. that pun that kind of makes the the rule um not so onerous mm -hmm. feeling but another good example is something like the swimming hole at p vine on p vine boulevard right right before you get to the bridge there's a little pull off there looks to be maybe like three or four cars can park there you can walk down the hill so that's not really like a park that we want to necessarily direct people to but we still want to consider putting a sign there that lets people know it's okay to park there but we've got to be careful of its scale because we don't want it to necessarily look like a DOT sign, but we want it to be consistent with the rest of the sign network to let people know that it's okay if you park here and once you park, there's a swimming hole down the bottom of the hill or there's access to 
the, the path that leads you to look, you know, the, the bottom view of the village. You know, so it's things like that that we're going to be looking at too, that it is going to be a challenging location. What, what, what's what the scale of the sign? What what's the information? What we want to do is direct people like, so many home next left. You know, yeah. yeah. That's too much. Or give know? them, if we've turned them to Peavine Park, we don't want them thinking those four spots are Peavine Park either, because Peavine Park is over the bridge and to the left, and there's more parking and there's more space to, to do things. So it's, there's definitely going to be some challenges to some of these, you know, the specifics. And I, I do have a problem of pulling that thread, and so there may be, a, you know, some of these that I do get more specific on. Uh, just because it's an outlier over here and there's no sense in leaving this one or that one, but... Oh, good. I'll, like, I'll just tell you, I know that y'all are keeping you over, but the, the two of us were working in a community in Alabama, and I mean, we went round and round because there's a major park and there's downtown. How many times did we drive back and forth? I think we drove seven or eight or nine times mm -hmm. back and forth because we're like... There's we, two ways you can go there. There's three. Or three. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's like, and then at the end of the day, we basically said, well, there's a primary way, but we need to have the alternate ways routed, you know, anyway, just in case. And, and the primary way, we have a reason for the primary way because we don't have to pass this ugly crap on the side, you know, that we can mm -hmm. do the straight line connection. But it was funny. You know, going through that exercise because we would. It was what, we two were or three not, miles and we, we spent not, an hour we were driving not fighting, three miles. But we were definitely in vivid discussion yeah. over, you know, what should be the right approach. So, so do you have a timeline when you yes. report to the town is to, to due? Yes, so we have a steering committee. We'll be reporting back to them. Um, we have. Um, up to three upcoming meetings with them, and then we're looking at toward the end of June, early July, to kind of wrap the project. So it's not a, it's not a suit, it's not, it's not a Bethel for all time frame. It's definitely more of a, uh, 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 we're implementing a piece of Bethel for all mm -hmm. time frame. There is a sign-up sheet over there on the table. If you want to receive news and updates, feel free to add your email. Most of you here, at least, are already on the table. <laughs> so, um, you can hear about it. Well, thank you all for coming out and spending the time. Well, thank you. It's been a long day for you. It's been fun. We've learned a lot. It's been a really good day. Yeah. So you meet with the merchants at 8? It is. We will not shut up on the way back, I'm sure. Well, we've had this conversation internally, but this is the most public input that we've gotten for a wayfinding project on the front end. Just because wayfinding is typically more a lot more logistical, than it is like it's more objective than subjective right. and but it's been incredible to just learn so much more nuance about Bethel and see more of the depth because you know I've been sort of looking at most of this project from a vehicular wayfinding system it's going to be super easy with a couple of you know park signs to like a big crazy park system with a couple of wayfinding signs, so it it's kind of flipped. It's flipped. It's, yeah, <laughs> right. it's flipped around now. Oh, yeah. So where do you have to fly to? LaGuardia first, and then Green GSP. Greenville, oh, Greenville. Greenville Spartanburg. Oh. Yeah, Greenville Spartanburg. Yeah. 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 Well, we're flying out at about 4.35 o'clock, so it should be early enough. I hope so. Yeah.